Good morning. Thanks for your patience. I'm Tom Sachs, and welcome to my show, Handmade Paintings at Aqua Valley Gallery on 79th and 5th in New York City. I'm going to take you through the show. Uh, we're going to look at about a dozen paintings today, and um, if you have some questions, send them in, and leave a little time for Q&A. Uh, let's just start with Krusty, Krusty the Clown. And so this is about six feet um, with a synthetic polymer on canvas, and uh, I painted it with a brush. And if you come close, you can see that there's all kinds of underpainting, um, which Nick Acquabella reminds us is called pentimento, where you can see that there were other arms underneath that I moved things around. And then this buildup here is called impasto. These are Italian terms from the Renaissance that help people describe what these paintings are about. And we can lean into those more. But I think it's important for you all to understand Krusty the Clown as my alter ego, the um, unsuccessful, successful alcoholic, Catskill uh, Borscht Belt comedian um, with the world of, at his disposal, yet he's still prey to his own weaknesses and indulgences. Um, this is from uh, a, a box of Krusty O cereal um, from the TV show The Simpsons. Um, I'll just kind of work our way around to the NASA meatball, which is kind of uh, the original design from the 1950s um, of the NASA logo, and it's of course a symbol of my space program that you can learn about. I would encourage you to watch the space program on iTunes. Um, this canvas is painted um, with a yellow edge sort of um, in homage and acknowledgement and recognition of Barnett Newman's Yellow Edge from 1968. It's a great painting. It's in the National Gallery in Montreal. And uh, I've made other copies of Yellow Edge, and it's, it's one of the themes that I keep lacing through my space program. Because if you look at Barnett Newman's Yellow Edge, it's just basically it's a black canvas with just a yellow zip on the edge. Barnett Newman, we can, get, we can geek out about it. Future episode is one of the most important artists as, as like an early abstract expressionist. Um, but my fantasy is after the apocalypse and all their all the canvases are painted over, I'm gonna have to break into museums to get other paintings to paint over them. And the first ones that I would go to are the Newmans because they're so plain, they'd be the easiest to paint over, like a Newman or Rothko. I think a Pollock or a Van Gogh would be much more difficult because there's so much going on. You you have to use a lot of precious, precious paint. Whereas if you start with Newman's Yellow Edge, and maybe we'll post a picture of the Yellow Edge later today, you can see that it would be really easy to just go with like a white, white out pen and draw painting over it. Um, so again, um, NASA 2020.364. This, this means the year. This is the 364th thing I made that year. For a little reference, everything in my life is serial numbered. I'm 2007-153, I'm the 153rd thing logged into our database of, um, in 2007. So let's, let's work our way over to um, Reese's. And um, so this is like a seven foot square, um, again, synthetic polymer um, on wood, but this has palladium uh, edging, yeah, sort of filled like a candy bar. Um, Again, you'll see all kinds of corrections. We go through this whole show. The things that are important to me are um, when I make a mistake and I fix it, sometimes I use white out, like you might use. But in this case, we'll also use orange out. So you can see, this is, I made a mistake on this edge and this is painted with an orange out paint. Also, synthetic polymer or acrylic to be less pretentious, but that's like technically what it is. Um, the, the, Orange shows, the orange out shows, and you'll see that all over. You'll see yellow outs, white outs, um, maybe other on other paintings, better examples. And then maybe you can see here, this is um, varnish just on the, on the Reese's letter. Everything else is unvarnished. It just brings a little more light into it.
So Oshizaki is the best ice cube maker on the planet. If you're going to make ice, you want a Hoshizaki ice maker. Um, I'm committed to the best. I use golden acrylics. They're the best paints that I've been able to find. Um, the incredible customer service. I love golden. So shout out to those guys. Yeah. Um, same with when you're making ice. I would recommend a Hoshizaki Cube Star. That's what we use in the space program for making um, ice for the astronauts. Uh, 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 liquid cooling mermaids. Um, no. So maybe we should go into the other gallery. Take a moment there. Hi. Hey, if you guys want to be part of this tour, just stand behind me, but if you could just, because we're talking about. Okay. Right. Thanks. So let's go into the other gallery. Thanks so much for, for joining. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we're lucky. Sorry about mass, like your mass Thank you. So, let's just go. So, welcome to, uh, I guess, the large main gallery. And um, let's start with Lagare and, again, synthetic polymer um, and oil on canvas. And I think this was. Um, this is kind of a very personal piece because it's combining two really important icons. In the 90s, when I was first moved to New York, there was this great hip hop band called Wu Tang Clan, and they kind of were coming up around the same time that I was. And the thing that was special about the Wu Tang Clan, besides their amazing music, which I recommend if you want to learn about them, just get enter the 36 chambers, was that the Wu-Tang Clan was kind of the first, well maybe Public Enemy was the very first band, hip-hop band that had a great logo. This is their logo, this, this Shaolin bird. Also, by the way, you'll see lots of birds in this show. There's a penguin and eagles and some others. But um, the Wu-Tang Clan, in addition to being maybe the seminal 90s um, hip-hop band, had great branding. Even had their own nail salon and had a, one of the guys had his own clothing company. So these are guys who really em, embraced the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art. So not only did they have the best hip hop record with tons of hits and great beats, but they also had ideas of doing all kinds of other things that encapsulated the the the, the ethos of their of their team. And of course, the Wu Tang Clan was and still is in many ways a clan, a group of individuals to work together in a form like Voltron to produce an amazing sound. And although the, I'm not sure if the clothing line exists, and I don't think the nail, the nail salon still exists, the music still does, and the idea of touching everything is something that was very inspirational to me. And at the same time, La Durée is this um, super pretentious um, bakery in Paris that um, makes these macaroons that are very expensive, they're delicacies, they're terrible when you compare them to other Reese's or Snickers, but they're really um, coveted and the packaging is fantastic. And if you go to their, uh, their cafe in, I think, Place Vendôme, it's like a great French um, bistro or cafe, I got them confused, but a really good place to get chicken pot pie. Here in Soho, maybe it's not as good, but the, the quality of the macaroon is coveted and it's a status symbol dessert. It's a great thing to bring back for Paris. But of course, after I started doing that for my friends who love them so much, you know, gifts aren't for you, they're for others. They, you know, they opened in the Paris airport now. There's one um, uh, Madison, there's one in, uh, in, in Soho. I don't know. The quality is good, but like, who cares? Anyway, I guess the point was that Paris has always been a place of glamour and aspiration in the same way that Wu Tang's ambitions were aspirational and like we relate to them. So to me, this painting is like an important matchup of those two um, philosophies coming from very different places. Um, Snickers is, in a way, a really important piece in this show because, um, in addition, it's a, kind of the same strategy as Reese's. It's just increased density. You know, instead of palladium, you've got gold leaf, and again, the only central image is 
uh, is varnished, but a lot of it's in Japanese, and um, it kind of links to the thinking about um, uh, about superlative culture, um, the best, and that's what's happening in um, the the, the, the Hoshizaki Hume Star painting. And you know, when you go to um, Japan, it's the only place in the world that if you go to McDonald's in Japan and you get a Big Mac and they give it to you in the tray, it's the only place where the Big Mac that you eat looks exactly like the photograph on the wall. It still tastes like shit, still fucks up your digestive system, it's still like destroying the planet, it's the worst, but the, the, the dream is, is fully realized there. I think that's why you'll see, not just in this, but in other works, Japanese as a symbol of aspiration status. But in the true sense, because technology is, the, is really just the true development of all tradition. One sentence on every painting. One sentence, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so McDonald's, my way, um, really the best branding for the worst product. Um, again, the ultimate Kazakh Kunzberg. Um, McDonald's, you have to remember, is a real estate company. The McDonald's Corporation owns the land underneath all those restaurants and rents it to the franchisees. That's how that company works structurally. Um, uh, and yes, I do eat there when I'm on the road. Um, Eagle's Nest is the uh, logo of the studio, and you might have even seen me at Team Jersey, the Eagle's Nest, um, that we wear in the studio. And uh, it's 1991 is, is the year that I moved to New York City and started the painting studio. This is me, the big eagle with a chain around his ankle, and this is Oksana who I've been painting with for over 20 years, who's free to go whenever she wants, but stays because we work so well together. Um, yeah, this is us. This is, again, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm like, again, the Nessus Crunch is my, uh, was my favorite. It's kind of shitty when you compare it with Ritter Sport. If you want to get a Nessus Crunch, I would encourage you just to go to Fancy Deli, get rid of sport, or rid of sport cornflakes, they're better. But it is worth checking out. This is maybe the best example to show of a whiteout and of corrective paint. So here you can see the C was painted um, in red. It was too far over. I moved it. And you'll see all kinds of whiteout, blue out. You'll even see red out. And then the, in some of the colors, the, the crunch is highlighted with uh, acrylic. And here, here you can see this massive blue out stroke. So again, the, the idea is that like, Apple can never make anything as, 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 as shitty as I make, right? I could never make an iPhone, but this, there is no tolerance in our, in our time for things that show the evidence of the human being, yet there's nothing more important than the fact that we all exist, that we're individuals. Um, so, Family Guy, a little bit different than works in this room. This is marketry, so apply one of these letters are all cut out. Um, maybe just zoom right in and just get into the nugget of a family. I think you can see Brian here. Just real quick, the last two paintings. Um, chicken and a biscuit. 
was part of my youth mythology. It was it's a Nabisco cracker, but when I'm a kid, you can only get it in California, and so we brought it back, um, or, or people brought it back as a present. Um, and it had a particular weird smell, almost like a sexual smell. We always imagined that's what sex would smell like. We think it was probably just like soup powder on a Ritz cracker. Um, and I always imagine my, my surfing dreams. Uh, if, if, it, if we made a, a rock video about this painting, it would be that song, Surfing Bird, with um, a beautiful surfer um, riding onto the shore, giving you the finger. And then maybe last, is um, uh, synthetic polymer is the background. Gold, 24 karat gold leaf is the cloud, and the and the plane is woodburn. Um, this is a synthesis of um, of Andy Warhol's um, uh, matchbook with. Um, a matchbook that was used on Air, Air Force One. And again, this is more of a composite of different techniques. Wood burning, otherwise known as pyrography, you can see this, the smoke, and you can reel sandpaper and paint. And paint, you can see all 50 stars. Yeah. Or maybe you have some questions that you saved from before. We had a few come in. Let's go into the main hall. Yeah. Tell us. It's, it's, tell. About, it's about power and aspiration. If you look at all the things in the show, these are all things that, that I aspire to. I think when Wu Tang Clan happened, I was inspired by the, the creativity beyond the narrow confines of hip hop into like, the whole world. Or the idea of Eagle's Nest paintings, like having a crest that was um, like about world domination, and that you could do everything that, 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 that you that you're really only limited by your imagination. Um, similar, like if I'm gonna pick one symbol of power for the entire world, it's the United States. When you see the Air Force One plane with a with an American flag on it, I just I just see domination and terror coming in as an American. And I can imagine other countries when that Americans roll in, you know, the recon one coming up your main road of the highway that's been there your whole life, maybe it's a dirt road when you were a kid, but now it's paved with the asphalt, just the terror in the minds of the people who live there, a the place of conflict and exploitation. So, yeah, at the same time, it's also the place where, the freest place on earth where you can do a show like this and talk about these things and be really critical of the government and not be punished for it. So it's, it's, the best, it's the best country on earth. There's no place that's even close. As much as I love France and Japan, and I do love you, Japan, there's something um, about the it was like a, a Goldilocks of economics and development and incredible natural resources that led to the development of this great place where we could do terrible atrocities like what would happen in Vietnam, but around the same time we could also use all of our resources and create a fantastic art project like going to the moon and killing God just for pure um, in intimidation and ideas and hearts and minds. So um, these are tr truly American phenomena and not to mention that the greatest art of the 20th century, you know, the music, comes out of the greatest atrocity in the 18th and 19th century, which is, which is the slave trade and its continued repercussions in our society. But the flag represents all that, good, bad, and indifference. That's who we are. And that's why it's a symbol for what this show is about and what our lives are about. And more than any other flag, it's uh, it almost represents the world because the apotheosis of this, it's, 
You could argue really easily that it's the ultimate product of the Enlightenment. Another great question for those who've only seen your sculpture before. Can you try and contextualize all of these works within that? Yeah. Right. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, so this is the first painting show I've ever done. I've done probably 30 or 50 art shows, and they've always been a, a, a mix-up of insecurity, me wanting to do everything. Painting, sculpture, music, the way the place smells, the lighting, uniforms. The, even the so shoes and socks we wear, it's all part of what I've done. And I've always had a couple of paintings in the background. But uh, you know, Al Aquabella asked me to do this show because he really believed in these paintings. And kind of, I just want to give a shout out to Al and thank him and his family for um, saying, no, these paintings are really good. You can do a show just for them. And I think that um, in a lot of ways, doing a gazelle comes work. Doing so many things can be an expression of insecurity, and for this show, I really want to embrace painting and me as a painter, as an individual who did a very stroke on this. I still work with my team, and I have help filling, filling things in, but it's, it's, I'm, you know, we're a team, we're a teaching hospital, but it's still generated by, by my thoughts and my vision, and, um, and I lay every one of these globs on. Um, I think. It's, it's also it's just important to um, take a moment and step back and appreciate what, what you have and what you can do. And I think that so many of the shows that I've done in the past, I've done so many things because I haven't wanted to like trust that I could do a show just of paintings. And these are that. Also worth mentioning that a lot of the strategies of sculpture are in the paintings. So for example, we talked about white out, right? And red out, so you can see different colors of blue. I'm not sure how well the camera's picking up different colors of red or different colors of white to show the correction. That's something that's evident in the sculptures. You'll always see the pencil marks, you'll always see the screws, the droop, the, the glue drips, the cum stains, the welds. You never grind over a weld. That's all present. In the same way when he's painting, you'll see that it's painted with a brush and not rolled on. I possess the power to use a spray paint can or a professional auto body shop or to contract like so many artists of my generation, a professional to execute this in perfect style. But that, that, that's, that's something that anyone can do. And that's something that has been sort of one of the characteristics of my sculpture that's brought into every one of these paintings. And there, there's no exception. Like even if we go back to the end guy, All right, so like this scene is here because this is a four foot panel. That's how wide um, plywood comes, comes in four foot wide sheets. The screws are there. Sure, we could bond over those screws and make them go away, but then we get to see them. This pencil line here is because there is a frame underneath. If you turn to the side, you can see the frame. And I represented this sort of triangulated geodesic frame, just a marker, but just to remind you that there is structure going on in there. And these pencil marks are um, there to show that. And there are even sneaker prints from the making that are part of it. I don't think that we intended to do them, but it happened somewhere along the way, and it was important that we keep them. They're, they're, because they're, they're from our sneakers, the sneakers that we made for our team. So it's, it's not just any sneaker, it's ours. It's got the waffle print. Um, chip outs. That, so also, these chip outs are worth mentioning so we paint it but then cut it out with a jigsaw and so always with a with the wood of the sculpture we paint and then cut so you can see the evidence of it being made and sometimes little chips occur and it's again easy to fix them but there's more information on leaving them to say this was done by a human being with a jigsaw this is not done in the cnc machine this is done the old-fashioned way like um making love it's not about getting it over quickly it's about making it last and making it beautiful so I saw the movie, someone insulted someone by calling them an American lover. Like the idea that it's like efficient and productive. I thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> and yeah, same here, if you look at the side of, of this painting, it's worth seeing the side that there's a piece of Con Ed wood that was stolen from the street and then milled perfectly. 
and meant to support this canvas. But unlike that one, we did bondo over the screws. There are screws hidden underneath here. But it's because we made the piece and the screws are too disruptive to this beautiful sky. So sometimes I have my little rules, pain rules, sculpture rules, and I'll have to cheat them, fake them to achieve a better result. This has screws and a pencil line, but it was too disruptive. I wanted this plane flying through the sky uninterrupted. And I think it's important to make your rules. Some of you know about 10 bullets today. I can observe number five, um, be on time. But we did give you notifications. So by the way, if you're late, just, it's important that you just like let people know so they can plan accordingly. Um, and today, even if you're caught in traffic, you still have the phone, you can always reach people. Um, but in the same way, like the, one of the goals is to like, show the evidence of your work. Here, we wrote that one, but to greater effect. And for those who don't know Tom, how long have you been painting? Well, I mean, I think seriously since 91. I don't know how many years is that. Is that 30 years? About, Over 30 years. About 30 years. Yeah, about 30. Not, not counting high school, but I think professionally. I think the first time I exhibited my painting was probably 91 or 92, but I've been painting seriously since for 30 years, and this is the first time I've ever done a show. And again, uh, for station identification purposes, we're at Aqua Valley Gallery on 79th, um, between Madison and 5th um, in New York City. And this is on Tom Sachs, and this painting show is uh, handmade paintings. And it's up till December 18th. Great. By appointment. Great. Yeah, so come by appointment only. Um, if you are in the neighborhood, just show up and you can probably like wait outside if no one's around, but make an appointment. There are still slots. And if you can't make an appointment, just, just show up and stand up. Okay. Ready to sign off. Thanks for watching. Keep your different advice. Okay, so we're not ending? We're ready to end. Oh, we're ready to end. Oh, so we're ending. Um, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I um, uh, hope you come and see the show.